Hello, and welcome to the British Cartographic Society's Tea Time Talks. My name is Chris Tribunis, I am the coordinator for the Tea Time Talks, and will be today's chair. Today's speaker is Claire Selden. Claire is Principal Cartographer at Steer, specialising in wayfinding and major event cartography, as well as being a chart cartographer. She supports BCS as social media lead, and has been a regular contributor in various roles since 2004. Today's talk is on Kingbridge Wayfinding. We will hear about wayfinding, the process that Steer went through creating the mapping, including the inspiration for the design, the online nature of research and meetings, and the final mapping along with his supporting content. And now without further ado, I'll hand you over to Claire. So yes, thank you everybody for um, joining us today for our Tea Time Talk. It's been a busy week with BCS with last week with the conference. So uh, there's lots of names that I recognise popping up there um, and some new ones as well. So I'm um, glad that you could make it um, join us today. So yes, today I'm going to be talking about our recent Kingsbridge unique wayfinding map. We do a lot of wayfinding um, maps at Steer, but this one in particular, um, through quite a, a threw up quite a few challenges um, and so it's been quite interesting to look back on it um, a bit more and um, share some of the findings and some of the unique things that we did um, with this particular project. So I'm going to run through a bit of an introduction of who I am and who Steer are, um, a little bit about Kingsbridge, um, a little bit about the wayfinding aspect, a bit about William Cookworthy who's our inspiration for the design, um, talk you through some of the design development, some of the um, challenges that we faced delivering this through um, lockdown number three here in the UK, um, and then show you some of the final product outputs. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So as Chris said, I'm Claire Selden. I'm a chartered geographer and principal cartographer at Steer. And I sit within the Design for Movement team at Steer, which um, covers architects, branding, graphic designers, 3D specialists, um, geospatial analysis, master planning, quite a range of different things. Um, and as a cartographer, I sit quite neatly between the geospatial analytics team and the graphic design team. Um, and on this particular project, I worked very closely with our graphic designer, Emily Whiteside, also principal um, consultant, um, who led on uh, the design elements. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to cover some of those today because she's the expert on it. But please ask questions if you need to, and I'll try and answer them. Uh, if not, follow Emily on Twitter and you can ask her more questions. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's design for movement. So Kingsbridge is a quite a small town down in South Devon, uh, next to an area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, sits right on the estuary um, and is surrounded by lush green rolling countryside. Um, and when we get a project like this, we think, oh great, this is fantastic. We're sort of in our London office, um, you know, rub our hands together, we'll get a train ticket down there and go and uh, have a look round and have a nice jolly day out. Of course, this uh, project came in January 2021 this year, um, in the middle of our um, third lockdown. So we were like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, and part of the reason that the um, council, the town council actually wanted to go ahead with some work like this at that particular time was that they were seeing a rise in people that, like anticipating a rise and as they'd done in the summer before um as during the pandemic many uk residents had had to change their international holiday habits um, and so what what was once a small seasonal tourist destination during the summer holidays only um were anticipating and had been the previous summer um welcoming more tourists to its eclectic selection of shopping and the rural activities around it 
So a wayfinding system of three signs was identified by us and our partners Trueform, who are the manufacturers, to benefit the local economy by encouraging visitors to stay longer in the area and explore all that was on offer. So it was noted by the Tourist Information Office that many visitors, um, this was the previous summer, had been asking where the estuary was. Um, and you can see here, so this was our, um, one of our, the mock-ups from um, early on that um, when we were looking at the location planning for the uh, strategy. And we, they were sort of saying, you know, we'll, we'll put one about around here in the um, main town square. Um, and where were the other ones? You know, we wanted one up. Um, so this is a hill. It's actually like, so the estuary is down here, um, just sneaked on the bottom of the map here. And then you've got the town square. The tourist information centre is just here. It's a hexagonal building. It's in this photograph in the corner here. Um, they wanted, and we sort of identified another location um, near these crossroads there's um, a lay-by uh, or a parking area here and some uh, town information boards I thought that would be a good place to do and then this goes up the hill here and there's actually um, more in, more interesting places to visit um, along 4th Street and um, higher up the museum is as well so um, and this is quite a key location where there's a lot of parking um, from the Tesco's um, and you can walk through here as well as the 4th Street car park um, as well as the um, town park on this side so this was quite a key location um, for visitors to use as well so as you can see from here the tourist information center um, is just to the north side of this town square here and people would come in asking where the estuary was and they'd sort of point right behind them and you know put them at the door following um and right there so it kind of became apparent to them that they really needed um some signage and mapping um in kingsbridge to um to help people locate what they were looking for so the map and sign design was developed um, through research in Kingsbridge history via their museum so our inspiration was taken from William Cookworthy namesake of their local museum who was the first in the UK to create the hard paste porcelain like that imported from China uh, in the late 1700s Edmund de Waal, a noted English artist, potter and author, wrote a book on Cookworthy and his contemporaries like Josiah Wedgwood. And we found lots of inspiration from this on how Cookworthy's porcelain was created in Kingsbridge and how the texture of it and tenderness of it impacted its design. The irregular shape of the icons are reminiscent of the unique pieces created and the addition of textures and the tenderness of the art all add to your experience of a place or object. Our colour palette with the cobalt blue and dog rose gold all came from inspirational quotes throughout this research. Um, I don't think I covered, I'm just going to mention it as well, um, a little bit about the font that we used. So the typeface is called Mrs Eves. Um, and this was something that we developed, um, that, that we chose from looking at the um, type on the back of the plates. This is one of the imprints from 1770 um, from the factory in Plymouth. Um, and so there was a lot of inspiration, not only um, from the colouring and that obviously through the plates that um, were designed with the, mimicking the um, pieces coming over from China um, in the early part of that century. But um, but yeah, this is how you can see the slightly irregular icon shape um, going through our um, designs here. Um, and I like this piece uh, of information, this the quote from the um, Edmund of Arles book about how all porcelain sounds differently at the moment it hits the floor. There's just something nice in this, you know, trying to make something unique um, for this project and not just copying previous wayfinding projects or um, designs and styles. And we were allowed sort of the bit more um, imagination and design to look at things. And this, you know, thinking about how unique porcelain pieces were and the brilliant link with William Cookworthy um, and Kingsbridge just fitted really well. 
So here we have our first OpenStreetMap derived um, wayfinding map. You can see here how we um, designed, we chose to have some building illustrations um, with the town. So obviously it's not a very big town. Um, we didn't want to, we didn't have that much data. We didn't want to show all of the um, urban area in detail for the town. It's got very specific um, areas of retail that the town council wanted to promote to tourists. Um, it was important to include some of the non-tourist information, like where the um, colleges were and things like that for locals. But this was mainly seen as a tourist um, piece of information for people not being familiar with the area um, and for to encourage people to explore the area. So as well as the building illustrations, which were key to highlight the uh, places of interest, we also created some indication of movement through boat design. So here we have, um, we were keen to put not just the physical feature of the quay um, and dock on the, um, at the quayside here, but also to actually put some boats in there as well to help make it look a bit more like Kingsbridge actually looks in reality. Um, we also use the cobalt blue for key features. So for the UR here um, in the center and for our approximate um, walking guide. And then we also added texture for the trees and the urban environment. So that would allow on the um, final product for it to be a bit more interesting and not so um, flat looking as maps often can do, especially in different lights and things. So uh, on the right hand side here, you can see a tiered hierarchy was then produced for the features in order of prominence. And this is something we do a lot of research in for our large city projects, working with community groups uh, to identify the type of land use for the destination and building the prominence up from there. Um, in this case, also we weren't able to have community workshops as we usually would. We've, um, Done that a lot over the years, but uh, we use the town councillors um, to great effect. Um, and there's quite quite a diverse group of people um, on that council, so um, it really helps to get a good spectrum of the information and to create help create that tiered hierarchy. So this was the actual sign design. Um, we went for um, two. It's right, two midi lists, um, which are the taller, slightly narrower design, and one monolith sign, which is the wider one on the right hand side here. Um, we also included heads up maps and directions. So rather than it just being north up, um, we suggested having a north up version and a south up version on the opposite side so that would help people especially coming down the hill it, it worked out quite nicely that uphill was actually pretty much north and downhill was pretty much south um and because if it had been east to west it would have been a bit more difficult to well, we would have probably still gone with heads up because that's our sort of preferred thing in these situations where they're placed but it worked really really well um in this instance so we had the heads up mapping. So you can see here, the um, this is a, the north face one um, pointing north. Sorry, so it's the south facing um, thing with north ahead of you with the estuary at the bottom. And then this side, um, you've got the south facing um, go, going towards the south and it's the, on the north side of the actual column. Um, we you will see here that we have a locator name uh, again using the same typefaces that we were um, talking about earlier. We have our directional information coming second here. Um, I don't think I put one on here with the head type, but this is more um, head level, eye level from a distance as well. We have uh, included off map pointers um, around the edge of the map so that because um, we relocate, we centered these maps. Um, on the uh, monoliths as we went traveled up the um, course so the off map pointers pointed to the other locations just outside of the map that would be picked up again on the next um, sign and obviously we had the local map 
Uh, we also include a region map um, or a context map. We included this one. There was various different scales that we um, looked at for this and whether we wanted to actually show in, 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 in more detail, so zoom in or zoom out. Um, and we ended up going with the region map um to help with some of the local rural wa wa walks that they wanted to encourage in the area so there's some lovely um sort of picnic walks um for like between half an hour and an hour along the estuary um and picnic benches that they wanted to get people people were obviously they were anticipating people being able to drive to the these towns and um when they were coming if a lot of the restaurants and things were still closed or pubs and services closed um due to lockdown then they could would bring a picnic or they could visit the the local shops um and buy them uh takeaway food and then go on the picnic um so they wanted to encourage that and make sure that um people knew where they could go they didn't just all have to sit um, on the estuary quay, they could walk for 10, 15 minutes um, along the estuary and find loads of picnic benches there for them to be able to use as well. So they had more options. Uh, we also included a key, obviously, for all our um, information, all our um, logos that we created. And then we also incorporated some interpretive information. So um, these were different on each side of the map. Um, and this was quite interesting because we had lots of information obviously through the research we um learned quite a lot about the pottery uh, and the porcelain um history side of it and they also had a great resource um in the museum with photographs of the local area um in from sort of like 100 years ago or more um and so what we decided along the three um signs in the town on the way up towards the museum, which was at the top of the hill um, at the far north um, of our project area, we would include some information and imagery about the things that were in the museum. So again, because it was um, Cookworthy that was that it was named after, there's a lot of information about his porcelain there. So we chose three porcelain pieces to go on the interpretive information on the um walk as you encountered these things on the way up the hill and then on the way down the hill we replaced them on the other side with uh historic information so um and pictures of the scenery of what it would look like what it looked like um 100 years ago for example and we used this um blue toning uh on all the photographs as well to link it all in with the design um, we also left space for the um, Kingsbridge logo, which is going through uh, an update at the moment. So um, our um, partners, Trueform, were helping them with that at the time. And through our design, they then wanted to tweak um, their own logo design to fit in with this a bit more. So that was really great that we were able to um, help influence um, some redesign and restyle. And we were able to do that at the same time as well. Um, and then all the copyright and information and sign ID um, at the bottom here as well on that path. So there's like three panels. There's the top one there um, with the key directional information, the second one here with all the map um, and logo information. And then this bottom um, panel here, the foot panel, actually we included a subtle pattern reminiscent of the designs um, of the porcelain here. And that actually helps because it will hide any dirt that will accumulate over time. So obviously all these kinds of things have to have a cleaning regime put in place, what they should do. Um, lots of places don't, um, but it's really important to include them in their um, weekly or daily cleaning schedules with the street cleaners, for example. Um, but having a subtle pan pattern here on a solid color um, on the wayfinding really helps to kind of just mask any interim sort of um, kick up surface dirt off the ground as well. Because um, if it is a, just a mat or a, a plain or shiny surface, the dirt shows up a lot worse. Like you can imagine on cars and that when it's um, when you, you can see dirt on a car a lot easier when it's like a shiny one than it would be if it was patterned slightly. So that was that, that's the main key elements. And then you've also got this sidebar. Um, which is a bit difficult to sort of interpret from here, but um, along um, the centre uh, between the two panels, we 
were able to put a strong cobalt blue color in there so that um, it caught people's eye um, and it fitted in with the design, but it wasn't too distracting. It wasn't like sort of shouting too much, but it was a nice, nice touch from there. And I hope I'll show you the photographs at the end of the final design. So delivering through COVID-19 restrictions, um, luckily, thank goodness, our client team were nothing like the UK's infamous Handforth Parish Council that made international news during the pandemic after their chaotic meeting went viral. Um, but the whole team at, um, at Kingsbridge Town Council were amazing. Um, they were able to meet regularly via Zoom to talk through the design elements. Um, we also had our manufacturers True Form on the call as well to help with things. Um, something that ordinarily wouldn't have happened probably. Um, we had the whole, like having the whole team on there, having all of the, you know, as many town councillors on the call as possible and having myself and Emily um, and any other any other steer people that were working on it and having the manufacturers on um, as well at the same time. Traditionally, probably if we'd have been able to go down to Kingsbridge, maybe only the project manager would have traveled down and seen the client in person and maybe not all of the um, town councillors would have been able to attend that whole meeting um, online. So I think that was a benefit to this project in particular that we had so much everybody had um, really good impact, uh, really good input into the project. Um, it was great to meet all of those on the town council and see their passion for the town they admire. Um, and that really came across um, from the parish councillors in their uh, passion for the town. And uh, our design idea linking to the porcelain was went down really well. It was a huge success. And we were able to get uh, personal book recommendations from the client team and share their enthusiasm. We successfully shared drafts and annotated on screen during the discussions to capture any comments. So that was that was how we dealt with um, like norm traditionally would be, you know, scribbling on a piece of paper and marking things up like that. And we managed to do it all um, uh, via PDF updates and capturing that information as we went along on screen. So to this construction, our partners Trueform, who installed the signs of agreed safety measures in place to be able to carry out safe construction for the public and their employees during um, 2020 and 2021. So uh, that was all excellent and was received very well um, by the town council. And the desktop research was the key element. So um, our online desktop research was um, extensively used to confirm and check all the mapping data, as well as the design development. We did have to use Google Street View um, quite a bit for checking most of the open source map data. However, um, there's lots of little tiny alleyways in um, Kingsbridge um, dating back centuries um that they used to use um and google street view doesn't go down those um this this one's actually called squeeze belly lane um and you do have to like squeeze down to get down there if you look on if, put in squeeze belly lane on um, on google Maps sometime and see how narrow that um, passageway is um we managed to get it on the map and i think we labeled it i think we just managed to get a uh, and it's quite a long label it's always typical isn't it you get a little tiny little road and you've got a really long name to fit on it but that's mapping. Um, uh, so we did have to do a little bit of um, further research into the history of those um, and their use was conducted with the assistance of the local team there. And obviously, as I said, they, they're so passionate about their town and where they live that they were more than happy to go out on one of their daily walks um, to photograph what we needed or, um, or check um, some connection that we needed. It was, it was really great. Um, and then finally, the um, online, the museum's virtual online tour was excellent in helping us to understand more about the town, its history and its inhabitants. So they've got this great 3D um, interactive, um, like sort of 3D Google Street View um, inside the museum um, on all of the floors as well. So you can click on and move through the museum. Um, and that was really useful for us to get a, a first initial understanding of the history of the town and um, and obviously the, the special porcelain pieces that they that they had um, that were particularly relevant. So these are the final maps. So obviously on the left hand side here we have a one to twenty five thousand scale for the um, overview map and a one to fifteen hundred scale for the town map. 
Um, and this was obviously the whole coverage of the town map. And then we sectioned that out. We had three separate um, walking circle, you are here, um, extracts for that. And then three more for the reverse side where we um, turned all the text upside down, turned all the buildings the right way around for the south walking version. And the same with the regional map. And I'll just show you some of the small little unique details for um, Kingsbridge. Kingsbridge has the world's smallest disco. Um, it's a disco in a phone box. Um, they're very proud of it. It's bizarre. I'd love to go one day and, and um, see exactly how many people you can fit maybe into a world's smallest disco. But that had to go on the map. They were very keen on that. Um, so we, we included that at the top here. Um, obviously, there's a big um, water loving society there. So um, leisure icons, including the more unusual crabbing spots, uh, paddle boarding, kayaking, uh, were all included and de designed specially for this project. Um, they also had the Kingsbridge Gardens in bloom. So we managed to um, include those on the map. Um, it was also found to be important to include the defibrillator um, maps. There was quite a conversation around this about whether to include defibrillator um, icons on the map because it was felt, well, yeah, but you could put it on a map and people, you're not going to, if, so, if there was an emergency situation like that, people aren't going to go, oh, we'll go and have a look at the map over there to find out where it is. You just, you know, it's not really the way of using it, but what after through discussions and talking about it and talking to the councillors about it and, and um, sort of, thinking about this, workshopping this a bit more, it was more about highlighting the fact that defibrillators um, exist in Kingsbridge. So there's one um, at the top of the high street um, by the world's smallest disco. Maybe if people have too much fun at the disco, they've got it there. Um, and the other one is um, down by Key House, um, the council offices um, and the town square in um, at the, near the estuary. So um, yeah, putting these things on the maps, it's quite a, uh, you know, everything, Everything on there was um, highly discussed and um, really thought about as to why we should put something on there and what the benefit of it was. And those were things that, um, that they really wanted to start promoting and start getting into the people's psyche about, OK, this is something that exists and, and making sure that people are aware of it. Um, and obviously that's that's the regional map there, just a zoom in on them. Um, we had these routes numbered and then listed in the legend as well so that people could follow um, and had a bit more information about where they were going to um, and the different routes around from there. So as I said before, there was one monolith and two um, mini liths, the taller of the two, um, of three items there. There's uh, it in place on the right hand side there. Um, it was a bit of a funny sort of half cloudy, half sunny day when these photographs were taken. So, um, and these were by the um, manufacturers that, uh, of the, in, the install team that did them. So thanks to them for getting us a few photos at least because we haven't been able to get down there ourselves. Um, and you can see here how you've got like the reversed side mapping um, going up and down on each side and the different um, interpretive information on each side as you go along as well from there. Yeah. That's it. Any questions? Thank you very much for that, Claire. That's been a jink. <laughs> that is actually is, is interesting. It's, a, it's something you don't usually you don't usually think of a lot of these things like what you see in that you see in town centres. Actually, it's <laughs> I was just thinking that they're going they're always there, and <laughs> you'd never think too much of the whole process of that goes into making them. So, well, as 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 you've said, we'll move on to the Q and A session. So. So we've got, so the first question we have is uh, your walking isochrone uh, runs across the estuary. Uh, did you think of breaking it there? Yeah, good point. Um, no, I, generally we always, even when it goes out into the sea, it's kind of, it, it, it helps with the, the isochrones as a focal point for the map. It serves not only just as um, inf a, a rough kind of. We talked about quite a lot about this as well because it's uphill um, in Kingsbridge. A five-minute walk in the north direction was is quite different to five minutes along the estuary, <laughs> and so it was like, should we put an ellipse on it or should we just? And it was like, look, this is it, it, it's going to change no matter what. So generally, these things are always 
um, there as a guide um, of a, a rough five minutes. And it does say approximate five minute on the actual um, map. We don't say definitely <laughs> five minute walk. Um, so people aren't disappointed. And also, like, obviously, p people that are um, different age ranges will be able to walk that distance in different modes. But we stick with the, I think it's 400 meters for five minute walk DFT um, guidance lines um, on most things like that. Um, and it just helps. I think that the whole thing just helps to focus the eye um, on the UR here in the middle as well. So it's it's there for, as, for, as a design choice as well as for walking information. <laughs> Okay, so that's nice, nice detailed answer from that officer. <laughs> so, okay, uh, okay. So, so another another question we have is, having developed a whole new design for this product, what other uses do the council think that they uh, this can be used for? Yeah, um, yeah. So having the whole obviously, um, I mentioned in the talk about the logo design. So they've kind of taken some of the elements, some of the colours that we designed for that and putting it into their um, actual town council logo design now. And um, they're also, they also have an old map in the bus station. So they're wanting to create um, a Northup version um, of the map for that that's not um, slightly tilted or anything mm. for their use for that. And also, because um, they have the Tourist Information Centre there as well, then we might be able to get a handheld map now that there's more um sort of giving out of of leaflets and things being allowed again um they're hoping um that we might be able to get one of those developed based on the same um design as well and maybe have some more interpretive information in there about the history as well okay so it sounds like it's been quite an impact on them just <laughs> seeing the design that you've that you've come up with okay so can you uh, can you give us an uh, any examples of other towns you have made similar maps of? I was thinking this myself, trying to wonder if other towns you've done. <laughs> um, yeah, so we um, we've done quite a lot of larger cities. So we we do all of the wayfinding for Toronto, mm -hmm. um, and we're also doing it in Ottawa as well, the capital in Canada. Um, in the UK, we've we do mainly smaller campuses so we've done middlesex we've done hendon campus um for the middlesex university north london um we've also designed we've actually designed some cemetery oh, i don't know if we did a wayfinding that we did a map for that we did a cemetery which was very interesting because you're not do you're not talking about oh making this really lively <laughs> and looking you know like it's a completely different um completely different design aspect that you're coming at it from um so designing things for the sort of smaller campuses as well um we've done sort of like larger towns like swindon um designed for those but i think really the you know a lot of them when we, and we use a lot of open source mapping and data for those and alongside whatever data the council are able to use or and sometimes um use master map data if the council's um, have the licenses to use that and go forward from there. But um, a lot of it is open source so that they can then go forward and create um, online. So our Swindon one was created and then we developed the um, Travel Choices website from the same data source as well. So we had that as a background. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Lots of big ones in Canada though. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's quite a mix, quite a mix, or quite a mix, and quite a, well, it's just a re interesting range of uh, environments as well. So, okay, on to the next. Uh, with this project being undertaken during lockdown, do you think it has affected our steer will tackle similar projects in the future? It it seems there have been uh, it seems like there have been benefits for this project. Yes, yeah, it's a really good question. Um... I yeah I think it it went really well um I, with a different team of councillors you can't <laughs> say the same you know I think we were very lucky that they were even with their um range of ages but they they were amazing um that you know they could all get on zoom they could all join in they could all share pdfs with us what they wanted they they'd scribble things down and scan it <laughs> in and send it to us and there was no barrier it felt felt 
very much like there were no barriers to um, people joining in and being able to access that. Whereas, um, yeah, I think previously it would have, you know, we always as, as project managers as well, try and make sure that there's one point of contact and things like that, which helps with the um, the, the project, you know, like we've got a, a, a margin to me and we can't be faffing about doing you know all these different changes from loads of different people and being conflicted and stuff but actually having that community of clients around us um to reach out to and ask questions and things like that was was actually really nice um and made quite a big difference yeah with a big with a big city like with toronto we, you'd never be able to do that because <laughs> there'd be you know um york want to do one thing and, and toronto and, yeah and so it it's too widespread but when it a very small area like that i think it worked really nicely because it was it was really defined and focused yeah i think you had the advantage i think you had the advantage that it actually been uh, well we've been going through everything for the last well for quite a while by that stage so everyone has got used to all the virtual meetings and uh... yeah luckily it was like sort of january february this year rather than um june july last year when they decided <laughs> to do it it might have been a different story it probably would have been a may well have been a very different experience yeah so, okay, so uh, what was your favourite part of the project? Oh, good question. Um, I think, I say, I can't take all the credit for all the design um, side of it that um, Emily worked on with the, from the pottery side, from the porcelain side and looking at that. But seeing the thing, the, the icons and that that she created, like the little crab, um and having the boat move along the water and and you know the textures that she included in the mapping um side of it from there i think that that was my favorite sort of outcome of the project that really kind of inspired me and was a bit like i was a bit like oh yeah no that you know this you know she's a graphic designer so <laughs> she comes at things a little bit different to me i'm a i am a cartographer and i you know obviously got some design skills i like to think but um you know she came at it from a very different angle um and yeah seeing those and inspiring me hopefully to to cre recreate some things like that in the future and, and tackle it differently i think yeah so very it's the different different minds working out different minds produce some very can produce some very different ideas there that's the, always useful for well inspiration going forward as well as, as you said there so um okay does the world's smallest disco have a social distancing policy. I think it must have. I think it's one in, one out. If your name's not down, you're not coming in. <laughs> a very a unique, a unique little, fe a unique little feature. Yeah, Quite everybody literally. knows about it now. Um, <laughs> because they were like oh do we want to put it on the map do we want to tell everybody about it i think they're quite protective over it um <laughs> they're, they're funny little phone box um at the top of their their hill but um yeah no they're, they're quite proud of it i don't i don't know if they've got they must have a guinness world record or something it's it you know they've got very proud that it's the world's smallest disco so um yeah <laughs> if you're ever would... down in south devon go check it out i would suspect they probably do i suspect that's something people want to look up afterwards because it's <laughs> Uh, so, I have, to, I have to say that it's been a lot. It's been a very, it's been a very, it's been a very interesting talk and a nice, nice bit of insight into uh, wayfinding maps. It's uh, again, as I said at the beginning, there, uh, I, it's not something, it's not something you, it's not something you truly think of, and uh, it's, and when you see the amount of work that goes into it and the thought, it's. Uh, just yeah, we see a lot. I went into London yesterday for the first time in quite a long time, and obviously I always catch legible London. I'm always looking for a legible London map and, and stuff, <laughs> and looking at those. And um, and I saw one that just had the map coming soon. It's um, uh, just outside Leicester Square, and I was like, oh, I wonder who's work. I wonder which one of my friends is working on that now. Kind of thing. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> somebody needs to get the get a, a wriggle on and uh, and get that map updated. But uh, yeah, these things are just that they're in. The, a lot of them are just in the background now, but people are still using them. It's great. Mm. I, I hope you know that people find them useful to in new cities that they go to. And uh, if you've ever been to Toronto um, and used them, then do let me know because we're always up for some feedback. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure once things start returning, I'm sure once things start returning to normal, everyone. Will, if anyone's if anyone's out in Toronto, it's probably a good <laughs> idea to <laughs> have a look for them. Have a look for these maps now. It's the Thank you very much for joining us today. 
I want to say thanks to Claire once again for such an interesting talk. Our next talk will be from will be from Andrew Hinton and Christine Walton from the UK Hydrographic Office. They will be giving the talk Maritime Cartography in UK Waters a brief explanation. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you and goodbye.